Well, next week is a baptism. I love baptism Sundays, and I used to do them at all times of the week, but we have a baptism high and lifted up back here, and uh, it's a good thing to do it when we're together. I think that's the right thing to do it, as people declare. I think we'll have five or six next Sunday, and then we'll do another one on Easter Sunday, which is fun. And so if you have not been baptized, and you're wondering, hey, what about this? Sign up. Talk to me, and I'd love to talk to you about your faith and what the Lord's doing, and you can follow Him in the waters of baptism. Well, as mentioned before, we are returning back to John chapter 17. So we're going back to that passage. Uh, Jesus is praying here, and He prayed for Himself as we looked at last week. This week, now He starts to pray for His, his apostles. And it is important for us to understand what was on Christ's heart for them and then what it means for us. We're going to learn about who these men were and how God had formed them, selected them, working in Him, and how this gives us confidence in what we have. We're going to learn that what their greatest threat was that Jesus prayed against, and it might be a little different than you thought. And we're going to learn about the importance of sanctification and what that means. So there's great things for us in this passage today. I do want to set it up by a different passage, though, <laughs> okay? And so you're like, I'm already in John. Well, put your finger there, and I want you to go ahead and turn over to Ephesians chapter 2, okay? In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is describing the church, and he's using an illustration, a metaphor, as the church is like a building, and he talks about the prophets, and he talks about the apostles being foundation stones as Christ is the cornerstone. And so I just want to bring us to that passage that we would get this language as the prophets and apostles being a foundation stones, then will lead us into the prayer of Jesus. So this is Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 19. This is what is written for us. You are, you, 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 you in this building, you are, we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We are built on the foundation, here it is, of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for, the, uh, for God by the Spirit. Now there's messages inside of this, okay? But I want us to see the, what God is doing. All of the prophets, we have what they're written in the Old Testament, point to Jesus Christ. And all of the apostles, which were, were Christ, point back to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And through these men's lives that God specifically called, that God empowered by His Spirit, both the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament, are like foundation stones that are laid out and together so that we who are following after would be built into God's house called the church. This is important for us to realize. Now, this building that we're standing is, it's strong, right? It's made of brick, and below the brick is concrete with, I'm sure, rebarb, and it goes deep into the ground. But the real foundation of our faith is way beyond the foundation on this building, right? It's built upon by the Spirit of God, the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ. This is the firm foundation of our lives. The truth is that each one of us is building our life on something. Some type of theology, our understanding of God, be it you don't think there's a God, be it to a different God, be it to the God that's represented by the Bible. Every person has a theological understanding. 
And also connected with that, there's philosophies and ways that we view life and how we understand ourselves, how we understand eternity, how we understand this world. Every person has these philosophical and theological foundations. The question is, what are you building your life upon, right? What will last? When Jesus Christ was preaching, we see this in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and he gave all of these teachings. At the very, very end, he says, now let me tell you, those who put what I teach, this is Jesus talking, what he taught are like building their house upon a rock, right? Something solid that when the tests of time comes, and there are testings of our faith. There are testings of things that happen to us and around us. There are these testings or the winds or the storm. If your life is built upon a theology other than Jesus Christ or a foundation other than Jesus Christ, it's going to be trouble for you, right? Things will knock over and get into place and you'll be exposed and the winds of this world will come and seek to destroy you and your life. So this morning, we're talking about this foundation. And Jesus prayed for these apostles. And it was, again, it's important for us to understand who these men were so that when we read the scriptures, we'll have great confidence, right? The Holy Spirit is there working, but great confidence. These were not just a bunch of men who thought it was a good idea to start a new religion, okay? These are men who believe. These are men who follow. These are men who obey. These are men who gave their life to Christ and his cause. This is the foundation in which we build our faith. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. So we're going to talk about this foundation. So now we're going over to John chapter 17. My first point, and there's three, is our foundation is solid. It is solid. Now again, put, us, put ourselves in the context of what's happening here. Right? Jesus is going to be betrayed. Judas had already left. He had already talked to the officials, both the Romans and the, um, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay? Already going to happen. He's going to be betrayed, and he's giving these men his words, pay attention, and then he prays for them. Again, this is the longest prayer recorded of Jesus in the entire Bible. It is significant. And we saw what Jesus prayed for himself last week, that he would be glorified so that he can glorify the Father. That was his mission. And then he focused to those who are with him. And again, this prayer is profound, and it's interesting, and it's important. So let's take a look at it, okay? So here we go, John chapter 17, starting with verse 6. This is what is recorded for us. I have revealed you, this is Jesus praying, to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Verse 7, now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they <laughs> accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Okay, we're going to pause there, and we're going to observe some things from the text that is applicable to this foundation, our foundation. Okay, number one, here they are in italics, Jesus revealed the Father to them. And by the way, if you're online, there are notes available. I'm sure they're in the chat room or go over to our website. These things are there. Okay, so the first thing we observe in this passage, Jesus revealed the Father to them. Now, if you remember from last week, okay, you can just go back a couple verses. Jesus' primary mission was to reveal the knowledge of God, reveal the Father to those who were there. 
Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. He is the face, uh, excuse me, the face, so to speak, of the Father. And so when people observed Jesus, they gained information about God because Jesus is the Son of God representing the Father. And so this is what Jesus did. And these apostles, those who were with him for at least three years, knew him up close and personal. They traveled as a group most of the time. They interacted with each other all of the time, and they saw Jesus. They saw him when he was in front of the crowd. They saw Jesus when he was praying alone. They saw Jesus in a small group, and they saw him with masses of people. Jesus wasn't some figure over there way a long way away that they were thinking, hmm, I think I might follow him. They knew him up close and personal. He wasn't hiding anything from them, and they knew exactly who this man was. This is important for us to know, that these men did indeed know Jesus, and they were revealed the heart of the Father like no other group. They had a clear understanding of God. Second, we see in verse 6 that the Father gave them to Jesus. These men were personally selected for the role they were to play. It wasn't like they thought it would be a good idea to follow Jesus, right? Jesus makes it very, very clear that these group of people, we saw Jesus, if you read the Gospels, he goes away and prays, comes back and says, okay, you, 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 and you, starts naming people to be close to him. Hand selected, appointed, chosen by God to be in these roles. Again, it wasn't like they were volunteering, oh, please pick me, or oh, wouldn't it be great if my, my face was in stone, uh, excuse me, in stained glass someday, right? You know what I'm saying? People do that, right? <laughs> they want to be in ministry so they can have a microphone, right? Wrong motive. Selected by God. Chosen by Him. This helps us in understanding who these people were. Next in verse 6, they obeyed the Word. Right? Have we ever talked about that in here? Have we ever talked about knowing words? We have. Important to hear the Word. More important that we tuck the Word in our heart, the Word of God, which is living and active. Now, these guys knew the Word, and more importantly, they aligned their life to it, right? Obeyed the Word. There's plenty of people who know words from the Bible, but they put it somewhere in the knowledge category, and they walk a different way. You know what I'm saying, right? People perhaps who grew up in church or they know something or read even the Bible. And there's plenty of people who have read the Bible, but they don't align their life to it or believe in it. These men were not playing. They were not just gathering information. They believed. And with that belief, there is obedience of faith. Does that ring a bell somewhere? We exist as Cross Point Church to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the people. Yes, I'm moving around. I'm just thinking of that. <laughs> I can't help it. Well, I can, but I'm not. <laughs> Put myself in a little box. Make a thumbs up. Obedience of faith, right? It's believing it. So much you say, I'm giving my life for this. This is what the faith of our forefathers consisted of. This is part of your spiritual DNA that is passed down to us in faith. These men were chosen. They were set apart. They saw the Father and they obeyed the word. Next, verse 7, they knew that Jesus had come from 
the Father. They knew what and who Jesus was. And they believed indeed that this was the Son of God, the Christ who takes away the sin of the world. They were convinced of this. They knew that the words and the actions and the plans were all from God the Father because Jesus and the Father were one. They knew that Jesus only said and did as the Father enabled and instructed. Isn't that curious, right? As you're reading through and as we have been reading through the Gospel of John, Jesus said, I only say what the Father instructs me to say. And I only do what the Father instructs me to do. There was this connection, a close, intimate, powerful connection that always was, by the way, and will always be. And they understood this as they interacted with Jesus, that they knew that Jesus indeed had come from God. They also were given the words of the Father. This is verse 8. And they accepted them as such. They equated the words of Jesus with the words of the Father. That God himself was speaking. And did he speak before through the prophets? The answer is yes. Does he speak through what is written there? Yes. Does he speak through the Holy Spirit? Indeed he does. The Son is the Word incarnate, right? Living, coming to life that we could observe and interact with and know and be known by. They believed this was the truth. Verse 8, they believed, and this is interesting, without a doubt that Jesus came from the Father. This belief was firmly established. And nothing would take it away from them. Even death, even betrayal, even torture. They were convinced of these things and it motivated them to continue to live in and with and for Christ. This is the internal motivation that I want each of us to have in our hearts. This will give us the fuel to keep going forward. When I often, when I speak to youth, and I don't do it as much as I once did, I talk about the difference between a cannonball and a missile, okay? Here's the difference. A cannonball, right? It's a weapon. It gets put into a cannon. It takes a lot of extra external force to get it going someplace. And over time, the pull of gravity works on this cannonball and it just hits the ground, right? In order to do it again, you got to load it in, you got to put all of this gunpowder in, and you have to set it off to go, right? Sometimes <laughs> Christianity is like we're cannonball Christians, right? It takes a lot of force to get us going anywhere, right? It could be a special service or it could be a retreat or it could be some type of event like 9-11 that we all get behind, we got to go somewhere. And then over time, it fades and dies. Why? Because the motivation is external. Now, a missile is different, right? A missile, right? A missile has fuel that's on the inside. It can go a lot farther. It can hit um, precise um, targets, and it can even be steered in the air. It gets to where it is intended to go because it's fueled from the inside. By the way, none of this is your notes. I'm just throwing it in for free, okay? <laughs> but it's important, right? If your Christianity is like a missile, right? Like these guys, there was an internal belief. It wasn't because a pastor said something. It wasn't because of, of an event externally. It wasn't because of some type of crisis. They hit the mark. They went the distance because they had fuel on the inside that got them there. Does that make sense, right? My hope is that we would be of the same faith, built on the same foundation, that we would believe. These men believed. And even the gates of hell would not prevail. Right? 
against the word, against the spirit of those who believed. They kept going. I remember when I first came to faith, well, when I came back to faith, I'll put it that way, when I was 17, right, had to figure things out, I was in high school, all of this type of thing, I started, by the way, just reading the New Testament. I had a youth pastor that gave it to me, a lot of questions about whatever, I just started reading it. And as I was reading it, no one told me, by the way, to read the Bible. I said, hmm, that'd probably be a good thing to read, right? And once I read it and I heard about this man named Jesus, I'm like, it's true. It's real. It's right. No one had to tell me to go to church. I just went to church because that's what they did here. And so I want to do that. I want to be with the people of God. I want to hear the words of God. I want to worship God with my faith family. And people said, well, it's just a fad. They said this to me when I'm 17. I'm not 17 anymore. <laughs> you noticed. Let me, let me show the camera this. I'm not 17 <laughs> anymore. I still believe by the grace of God, right? Because I believe what is written here, right? These men believed because they saw, they understood, firm foundation without a doubt that Jesus came from the Father. May God help us with that. Your faith is built upon a cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Right? Guess what? Pastors will fail you. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> the church at times will fail you. Jesus will not fail you. Right? Will not fail you. He is your faithful friend. Six closer than the brother. He showed the extent of his love, personalize it for you, for me, for us, loving us to the very end, redeeming us, sanctifying us, leading us, promising us eternity. In him was life. And him was light. So let your faith be built upon Christ. The words of the prophets, the cornerstone of Jesus, the words of the apostles as we are built together. It's important for us to know this. And Jesus, as he was praying to the Father about them, described these are these men. And God wanted us to know this prayer as well. That's why it's recorded by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus then continues in verse 9. He says this about them. He says, I pray for them. Now, I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I'm coming to you. The apostles were prayed for by Christ. They belong to Jesus. And they are his because the Father gave them to him. They're different from the world. And you, by the way, are different from the world. They had a special purpose. And God gave them some special attention. Notice that these guys in verse 10 gave glory to Christ. Right? Remember we talked about it last week if you were here? right? Glory, that is praise and honor, and esteem. Why did they do that? Because they saw the goodness of Christ. And we can say amen, right? They experienced His goodness. And so they therefore proclaimed Christ and who He was and what He did. And by doing so, it gave Him glory. Right? This was their aim. They were committed. They believed they obeyed, they had a unique role, and they were called apart, and they were solid. 
So when you read your scripture, as you are reading your scripture, okay, have confidence in what is written is of God. Have confidence that, again, I've heard this from people saying, well, you know, these guys are just, they wanted to start a new religion. They didn't want to start a new religion. Right? They believed that Jesus was the Christ and they proclaimed who he was. The apostles and the prophets proclaimed who he was. And so the words that we have were written by those who believed and showed that they believed by their obedience even to death. This is our foundation, and it is solid, right? Solid. Now, we're going to turn to the next things that Jesus prayed, and this is our foundation is unified. And I want us to pay special attention to what Jesus is praying here. He's praying for protection, right? He's praying for a threat, but the threat was to their unity, and it comes from three different places, and this is what Jesus prayed. This is John 17, starting in the second half of verse 11. Jesus prayed this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one Circle this. This is the point. They may be one as we are one. Now, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None of them has been lost except the one, which is Judas, doomed to destruction so that Scripture would be fulfilled. Pause right there. So the goal of this prayer of protection is that they would be unified. They would be one as the, check this out, Trinity is one. Now, Jesus knew that there are going to be hardships for them, right? Remember that he talked to them about this. Hey, listen, people are going to come after you. He didn't pray that they would be safe all the time. You notice that? He didn't pray, oh God, keep them away from all harm and danger. They faced harm. They were in danger. History tells us that most of them were killed for their faith. Minus one, John the Apostle, which we're reading about, who, by the way, was tortured, and then he was cast out to an island by himself in exile. He didn't pray that they wouldn't be harmed physically or that they would never face hardship. Know what he prayed? He prayed, God, protect them so that they would be one. One with Jesus himself and one with each other. You know that by our nature, we tend to fight with our fellow human beings. You know that, right? Any type of unity within a corporation or a family is often a work of God or a miracle because there's cohesion together. Those who are separated from Christ and disconnected with the body of Christ are lost. Now that's a strong statement. Jesus knew that there was going to be persecution. There was going to be problems within themselves, right? If you read the New Testament, you read the Gospels, you see sometimes that the apostles even fought among themselves, right? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? I bet it's going to be me because, you know, Thomas, he's a little weird, right? Jesus, put me at your right hand. Jesus says, hey, hey, hey. (laughs) Guys, knock it off. (laughs) If you want to be great, then be a servant. This is not for you to decide. Love one another. Serve 
one another. Be connected to one another. He says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. That's amazing. The name you gave me, which is in English, is called Jesus. Right? Jesus. Which tells us, tells me, tells us that we have more in common in the name of Jesus than we have uncommon in all the other interests and in, uh, nationalities and income level and edu- education. Jesus is the number one binding force, more than what school you went to or where you work or what your family of origin is. There is power in the name of Jesus. Gone to places. Perhaps you have gone to places in the world, right? Completely different culture, different language, different way of living, different food, different, a lot of stuff different. But we're family because we're in Christ, right? We're more connected in the unity that's in Jesus than anything that can separate us. So Jesus' name, calling yourself by the name of Christ, which is a Christian, right? In Jesus keeps us together. But when we, by the way, are separated out, we become quite vulnerable. And we go from being close to the heat of who Christ is, and we get away and drift And become vulnerable. And we'll see Jesus praying for the evil one to keep him away. The lion who is prowling, looking for those he can devour. I've been in ministry for almost 30 years now. Been able to preach to a lot of folks. And some folks are still strong and close to Christ. Where others have drifted away from Christ and are no longer walking with him or connected to the body of Christ. An illustration that I often use for this, you guys remember the, um, you guys ever barbecue, right? Cook outside? Remember the old charcoal, charcoal, right? What are those things called? Burquettes, Burquettes, charcoal burquettes, right? I hated using those things. Some people love it, right? I put way too much fluid on there, and it, my, my food smelled like letter fluid, but that was me. <laughs> I didn't have enough patience, right? right? Burn it right now, right? But the thing is, how are you supposed to light those things? What do you do? Put them in the middle, right? Put them all together, and you keep them close, you light them, and you wait. And the combined heat connects to all of these. No, I've literally done this. I've done this, put them in a pile, light them in fire, just like a little experiment. And I took one that was in the pile, and I put it aside. Guess which one stayed on fire and kept its heat? Those are together. The one that were separated out lost its heat, its warmth, its connection. Same is true in Christianity. Our flesh wants to raise ourselves up more than others. It's why Christianity talks about being humble. Our flesh wants to make life all about us. Christianity says it's all about Christ and loving one another. Jesus knew that even the apostles, the apostles, right, still had to Deal with the sin that lives within. Right? And that in the separation from one another and in the conflict from one another and the separation from Christ, the flame would die out. The same is true for you. And if you are kidding yourself and saying, well, you know, I can be a Christian, but I don't like As far as I understand, when I read in the New Testament, the Bible does not know of a Christian outside of a church community. 
We're called to be together. This is where we do the one another's, right? Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, weep with one another. Happens in community. We are to spur one another on for love and good deeds. And if we're separated from Christ apart from Him, you can do nothing. And so the greatest threat to your Christianity is not persecution, it's separation. Separation from Christ, separation from each other, where we become cold and we become vulnerable for the lion. The lion doesn't go and attack when, when, when the, uh, what do they usually eat? Gazelles. They don't, they don't attack them, right, when they're all together, right? Or zebras or whatever it is. It goes for the ones that are kind of struggling, straggling, kind of on their own, right? That's how it works. Jesus understood this and prayed for them, saying, Father, protect them by my name. Keep them in me. There is power there. Protect them so that they may be one. He continues to, to pray this now in verse 13. He says, now I am coming to you now, talking to the Father, to Jesus, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. God wants our joy to be full in our connection with Him and each other. Verse 14, I've given them your word, and and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Jesus' prayer here, by the way, about unity and connection, ultimately is about joy. Do you see that? (laughs) May they have the full measure of my joy within them. So we have two daughters, right? And we'd like to get together when we can. We're here in Rockford, one's in Nashville, one's in California. So we're separated by lots of miles, right? And so at Christmas time, we'd like to be together, right? So if it was just my wife and I together at Christmas, would we have joy? We would have joy. But if our girls weren't able to be with us, we wouldn't have the full measure of joy. If one can make it, that makes it even more joyous. And if we could all be there, the joy is of the full measure. Do you understand that, right? So Jesus was talking about that in our unity, in our connectivity, in our community with him and with each other, there is joy that is shared amongst each other. Your joy is multiplied when you're experiencing something with somebody else. When we say amen to that, we know that, right? If you go to a football game, it's more exciting if you have other people with you that you can celebrate. When you see perhaps a beautiful, I'm going to say sunset, because sunrises, I'd rather not see them. (laughs) Sunsets, I like, right? I'm a night person, right? It's one thing to observe it on your own. Oh, look at how beautiful it is. But the joy is expanded when you can say, do you see that? You see how gorgeous this is, and you can share that joy. That's why we share our pictures. That's why we share things on the, uh, in, on the internet, right? So that joy could be expanded, or that connection could be expanded. Jesus was saying, be together, okay? Be together because how you reflect me, and we're working together in this, and this is important. But second, Your joy is increased when it is connected and expanded in a community with other people, right? Now he says, now the world's going to hate you, right? They're going to hate you because you're not of the world, right? You are an alien, by the way, and stranger in this world. And some of you are stranger than others, okay? (laughs) Just kidding, but not really. Okay. (laughs) I love it, right? I love the diversity. But we're different than our surroundings, right? 
We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have life in his name. We believe in sacrifice and suffering for the sake of our neighbors. Snow blow your neighbor's driveway out, by the way. Especially if you don't like them. Hear me. This is practical. Love. And he says the world will hate you. The second thing, we have to fight our own flesh that causes us to not connect with each other. Fight that. We have to fight the world who wants to destroy us and pick us apart. You are crazy people. Like, hey, come join us. Be like us. Laugh at what we laugh at. Enjoy what we enjoy. Be a part of us. And that pulls us. And then, of course, the evil one. My prayer is that you do not take them out of the world, which is also interesting, right? Some religious organizations want to completely separate you. You can be a monk, right? Jesus says, wait a second, I'm calling you to be in the world, but what's the word? Not of the world, right? To be in connection, but not of, right? Be careful because there's an evil one that's coming against you. So we have internal um, desires that cause us to separate. We have the world from the outside wanting us to join them, and then we have a supernatural enemy that wants to separate you from Christ and each other. Jesus knew that and saw this as the biggest threat to the apostles, and that is the biggest threat to you as well. You know that. Your biggest threat is that, well, I might be injured for my faith or killed for my faith. The worst that can happen to you is that you'll die, and then you'll go to heaven. It's okay. The worst thing, that you get separated from Christ and life within Him. And then you die and remain separated from Him forever. Your connection to Christ expressed in your connection to his community matters. I know people are vulnerable when they just disengage and disconnect. And by the way, it always happens by degrees. It's not like someone's strong in the faith and then they're not. Take that, cameraman. Okay. just messing. People at home are like, why do we watch this? Okay. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. You know how it happens? <laughs> it happens like this. One little, eh, I don't want to read my Bible today. Eh, the guy who sat next to you last week had bad breath. Eh, I don't know about prayer. Uh, You know what? My bed is pretty dang warm. Uh, uh, I don't like those songs. Uh, You guys understand how that happens? That's why you got to fight it. (laughs) It's more important to be together with the body of Christ. Even though I don't feel like it, it doesn't matter feelings. We are connecting to the community of faith. We are connecting to Christ. That's where life happens. That's where life is. This is how we grow in the faith. Jesus knew that even in the apostles, that that could be the tendency. So he prayed that they would be protected by the name, that they'd be unified, that they'd be together so that they could proclaim the glory of God and live what they believed, right? And so he prays this for them. How much more do we need that prayer? You can say amen, right? Fight the tendency to connect or disconnect by degrees. Be intentional about connection and communication and knowing the word, Connecting. This is what Jesus prayed. And these guys, this prayer, of course, was 
answered and they were unified and this foundation was connected because if the foundation breaks up, the whole building's in trouble, right? If this foundation broke up, all of this would go, right? The most important thing is not that beam right there. It's what that beam is connected to underneath, right? That beam will go, but the foundation is solid. It will grow again. But the foundation that cracks, that thing goes and everything else goes, right? It's important. And these folks, it's important that they were sound. It's important that you're sound, right? That's why they talk about in the Scripture, elders or shepherds here, don't put them up. Look at their life. Don't put them up too quickly to know that what they believe is true. They believe it. Because if they crack, it's going to affect a whole lot more. Do you understand this, right? Let's go on, okay? <laughs> yes, you're talking for a long time, Dave. It's the last thing. I hear that laugh, by the way. Um, <laughs> the foundation is pure. But please, look at, look at these scriptures. They laugh, right? But it's pure, which means the word here, we're going to see this word sanctify here. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. <laughs> okay, John 17, 17. Through 19, Jesus continues, after he prays for protection, all of these things, he says this, Now, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified, right? Right? Now, what's this word sanctified? And different translations will use a different word, but here it's sanctified. And it means pure, okay? Sanctified is a, um, it's a state of being, it's a noun. We're back to, to, to high school. And it can be a, a verb, right? So one is sanctified or being sanctified verb, a process, okay? And so once we become into faith, the theological word is we're justified, right? We're set right. It's a legal term. We believe in Christ. Our sins are washed away. And then we enter into a process which is called theologically sanctification. That is becoming like Christ or having what is impure in us removed. Eliminate that which is incompatible with holiness. Don't you like that definition? wasn't mine, right? Removing in us what is incompatible with holiness so that the end result is what is there is pure. Actually, by the way, the word integrity, by the way, what integrity means that it is consistent throughout, right? Integrity meaning that you don't appear one way on Sunday and then the rest of the week are a different way that lacks integrity. Okay, And so, something that is pure, consistent throughout, so he says, sanctify them, make them like me by what? The truth. Right? The, your word is truth. Right? So the truth of Christ's word, the truth of Scripture given to us by the Holy Spirit helps to align our mind, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that we would think like Christ and then we would um, believe in these things and then live them out. Make them, purify them, sanctify them by your truth. Set them aside, something or somebody who is consecrated and dedicated for the purposes and service of the Lord. By the way, your Christ likeness. Sorry. Your Christ likeness is a means to an end. We become more and more like Christ so that we could glorify him so that we can do the things he's asked us to do. Do you understand that? Right? Some people think, "Well, I just want to be holy, holy, holy." But yet they do not do the words of Scripture, which includes 
loving your neighbor. Oh, wait, loving your enemy, which includes sacrifice in community, which includes giving of yourself to the glory of God and the benefit of others. Right? God, help us to uproot all of the selfishness and all of the pride and all of the arrogance and all of the anger and all of these things that inhibit us from doing God's work and His will in the world. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And verse 19 is a little curious. For them I consecrated or dedicated or sanctified myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Did Jesus then need to be perfected? Right? Did he need to be made perfect? Right? And so Hebrews chapter 5, by the way, talks about this. And what this means is that Jesus was completely with integrity. He was completely perfect. But his perfection was proved to be genuine through his obedience through suffering. Okay? Jesus went through the crucible just like um, a piece of um, gold, right? Goes through to be heated up, right? So that all of the impurities would rise up, so they can be skimmed off. So what is left and remained is perfect, purified, right? We're in that process. That's a good example of sanctification. Jesus went through the fire of suffering to prove that he was completely pure because there's nothing that came out of him that needed to be removed. Does that make sense? Right? And so he did this genuine so that when we are in him, it's proved that he indeed is sanctified so that we too may be truly sanctified because we're in him. This foundation stones, right, were pure, had integrity, went through fire, and were proved true. By the way, you and I go through difficulties. Anyone here been through a difficulty? All of us. The question is not, will you go through a difficulty? The question is, will you continue to persevere? And trust God that through this, He will use it to either, one, show us things in us, right? right? Dave Spooner can be really impatient. Oh, really? Yeah, really, right? I don't like to wait. Remember the charcoal illustration? Okay. It gets worse when I'm standing in line for something, right? Or things don't get done the way that I think they should be at the time I think they should be done. God, will you then, these things come up in my life, I see them, I was like, man, I got a problem. The best result would be, <laughs> God is not, God, make them go faster. I do pray that, by the way. <laughs> Which often is not answered. Actually, the right response is, boy, what I'm seeing in my heart isn't that good. God, forgive me. Get this out of my life. Help me. Right? Thank you, God, for the trial or the heat of this suffering. <laughs> Do you respond that way? I'm learning to respond that way. I don't always. So that would be more like you. Right? So we're going to end. We're actually going to sing a song that you probably haven't heard for a long time, or some of you have never heard this song. It's called, How Firm a Foundation. Do you know this song? Do you know this song? Just help me. Oh, most of us know the song. When's the last time you sung, sung this? Thank you. We're going to sing it today. Right? With a piano. Yay, Cheryl. Thank you for doing that. It's the name of this message, by the way, How Firm a Foundation. So as we conclude, and we're going to sing that, and we're going to, I'll say a benediction blessing over you at the end. Please remember this passage. Think about your own life. Thank God for the prophets and the apostles of God that worked in them and 
tried them, selected them, how they remain unified to him, to each other, how they appoint to Christ the foundation stone. Your foundation stone, the foundation of your faith is solid. Read the word, let the word be in you. Right? Second, be aware of the tendencies from inside, from outside, from supernatural that are trying to separate you from Christ with each other. Be really aware. Those online, be really aware. Super important that we're connected for our own faith and the glory of God. Many reasons. Watch this. And know that God is working in us to make us more like Christ so that we can do what he's asked us to do in the world. It's important to keep committed and serving the mission. It's not how you start in your Christianity that matters, but how you end. End well. Live well. Okay, so I'm going to pray. We're going to sing this song, and we're going to conclude. So God, thank you for this day. God, we thank you even for cold. Even though we don't like it, God helps us to persevere. Lord, Thank you, of course, for keeping us safe. But more importantly, God, I ask that the flame of your word would shine bright in the furnace of our hearts. God, God I ask that we'll feed it and it will grow and it will keep going regardless of the exterior temperature, literally and figuratively. If the culture is cold towards you, God, I ask that we would be on fire, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the community of faith. Thank you for the examples we read about in Scripture, we know about in history, we personally see in relationship. God, thank you. It helps us to continue pressing ahead. Thank you for the joy we get because we're in connected community. God, that's a gift from you. Thank you for that. God, do that more and more in this place, more and more in our hearts, more and more in our society. We thank you that we have a firm foundation. In Christ, you will never fail us. We thank you for those who have gone before, God, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.